Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. It doesn't matter if it's an issue in the courts, before the legislature, or even in the community. NICLU, the New York Civil Liberties Union, is there energetically protecting our civil rights and our civil liberties. Donna Lieberman is the executive director of this remarkable organization, and she's my guest today, and welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Ronnie. It's you great know, to be here. It's lovely always to have you. I was looking at some notes in the introduction I did a couple, the last time you were here, and you had an agenda of the issues you were interested in, right? And then now I see that you've had such victories in the last couple of months. It's been incredible. Yeah, it's really, um, it's kind of nice to win something now and yeah. again. Um, uh, that hasn't always been our experience. And um, uh, we feel that, that the, the interests of New Yorkers um, have been so well served by the work of the Civil Liberties Union. I just want to add that, because uh, some people don't know, we are the New York affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And about one, uh, one of the largest affiliates yes, in the country. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Us and the California. California, yeah. as usual. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you make a, a, a real impact on what happens here. Yeah, the way we approach problems is somewhat different now than it used to be, say, 20 years ago. Uh, and that's that we, we look at, we're known for our litigation, for our lawyering prowess, and, and we still go to court a lot as we need to, but, but we couple our legal um, approach with a policy approach and with a, a big grassroots advocacy approach. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're <laughs> on Insta, and, and um, it's important that, that our members and our supporters, you know, who knows how many in the era of social media, um, have an opportunity to have their voices heard. And some of the big issues that we've been working on and seeing some success, but there's always a long way to go, have to do with um, the issue of mass incarceration. I think, you know, New Yorkers, Americans now understand that decades of public policy that has landed people of color, particularly African American men, in jail for years and years and years, decades sometimes, for minor offenses, or even when they're not so minor offenses, you know, the notion of rehabilitation is like was out the window, has been out the window, and we just have been all about locking them up and throwing away the key, no matter what age they started at and no matter what age they are now. And, and so we're, we're kind of gratified that, that the, the challenges to mass incarceration are coming from, you know, places other than just the civil liberties yeah. crowd. Right. And so, so we won a huge victory um, on solitary confinement uh, in the state prison system. But we know uh, that, that, that winning a victory like that, sharply curtailing the use of solitary confinement, um, changing the conditions, I, I was going to say humanizing. Well, solitary will never be a human kind of punishment, but l making it less dehumanizing and less about stripping people of all human contact. These are important victories. Right now, they're victories on paper, and our challenge is to monitor and ensure that they actually become implemented, because there are so many forces against it, not the least of which is the culture of mm. our penal institutions. Some, so much, a part of the, the solitary confinement is the whole issue of mentally ill people incarcerated, right? Absolutely. So that becomes a whole other strand. What are we going to do with people? Yeah, like it's that? not just a whole other strand. It's a huge, it's a major uh, main strand, yeah. and it runs not just in the state prison system, but in in, in the the uh, local mm -hmm. jails. And Rikers Especially, Island yeah. is the case in point. You know what a total disaster. You know I've tried to take the position that we can reform Rikers. Mm. You know it may well be as out. as Melissa yeah. Mark Favorito said quite eloquently that it just sure. needs to be um, closed down. Yeah, so. And now there's, there's, there's um, you know, our, our political leaders, some of them at least, are talking about, you know, really reducing the population at Rikers, three quarters of which, more, 90% uh, almost, are pre-trial, presumed right, exactly. innocent. 
presumed innocent and being subjected and to these there horrific, for... torturous conditions. Right. You know, we have to reduce the population. Think about ways to to, to with, with people who are accused of crime to have, have a system so that they get back to court to answer for their crimes, not so that they're punished for years before they even get convicted. Well, you're also, you've also had a victory, I think, about providing counsel, yeah. which is another travesty that people don't have legal counsel. Yeah, you know, they don't even, they can't even understand what the charges are. Yeah, you know, you know um, we, won, we, we won Gideon, you know, decades ago. And we are fighting to make Gideon a reality. Now, Gideon, Gideon is Gideon what? Gideon v. Wainwright, the right to counsel mm -hmm. when you're accused of a crime. Gideon's Trumpet is the book that mm -hmm. everybody has read, Talks I with. hope, yeah. and, or at yeah. least knows of. And, and, and here in New York State? You know, it's honored in the breach. You know, sure, in New York City, there's legal aid, there's Bronx defenders. You know, they do a good job. But but outside of New York State, in New York City, in in many many communities, you know, the burden is put onto the onto the counties, mm -hmm. and the counties are all about you know pumping up their DAs and financing them and right. making sure they get paid. But when it comes to legal aid for those people, no way. And so we've established, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a, some clear standards for representation that the people have to know what they're doing when they're representing any people who are accused of serious crimes could lose their liberty that there's um, a state oversight um, uh, set up mm -hmm. the the office of uh, indigent legal services and we won that case in five counties but it's set yeah, up it a standard for, for statewide so five counties have gotten funding pursuant to our settlement but the rest are saying, well, what about us? And, and hopefully, and we're saying, well, what about them? And we're trying to make this victory go statewide. So that's where the advocacy becomes so important. Absolutely. You're very good at building these bases in the women's agenda, although we've got, what, two things still not accomplished? Yeah. That was an interesting thing to follow. Yeah, you know, the Women's Equality Agenda became the Women's Equality Act. We had a coalition of gazillions of organizations mm -hmm. around the state to support it. And, and the sad thing, the really, really sad thing amidst a very, very important set of victories in the Women's Equality Act is that New York couldn't find one pro-choice Republican to support codifying in black and white Roe versus Wade. Really, New York? I thought we were like a bluish state. But that was, that wouldn't, was that always that way? I well, don't think so. Well, you know, one of the ways New York became so pro-choice, actually, is by um, the dysfunction, by virtue of the dysfunction in Albany. Um, you need two houses of the legislature to make good things and bad happen. And the assembly has always been pro-choice. And the Senate has always been gerrymandered, rigged, mm. really, to mm. be anti-choice and, and controlled by the Republicans. And, and so th that's why bad things haven't happened. And that's also why good, good things, things haven't, haven't happened. happened. But all these Republicans, there, there are a bunch of Republicans who said to us, you know, oh, I'm with you. I'm pro-choice. I'm really pro-choice. And then they, 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 they did everything to stop being, having to take a vote on, on the right to choose. And it's crazy because, because what we're doing is making the law conform with what the law from the Supreme Court is. Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, duh. But, 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 but we couldn't get that through. And as a result, hospitals are sometimes too chicken you know, to, to, to ensure that, that when a woman is, is, is facing a disastrous pregnancy with the fetus isn't viable or, 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 or when her health is like in, in serious question. danger, they won't do an abortion, you know, when, when, when she needs it, you know, late in the pregnancy. Can't legislate courage, can we? Yeah, really, really. <laughs> Certainly not in the medical system. And also in right. the... In the <laughs> the legislative and politics. Yeah. Yeah, those two just like, you know, <laughs> oxymorons. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the other important thing was the surveillance of Muslim communities. Well, before we get to that, okay. I want to talk about paid family oh, leave. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. You know, there's, there's, you know, we tried to put paid family leave into the women's equality agenda, yeah. and we were unsuccessful. But we were talking about it a lot, and it's great to see that it's gained traction. You know, we need to have paid family leave, you know, for, for people who have to deal with a loved one being sick or a new baby. And, you know, it's time for the U.S. to catch up with the rest of the industrialized world 
and re respect families. The Republicans, so we, you, they used to be so pro-family, right? They're right? All pro you know, but, nothing. but not for living people. Yeah. And and <laughs> and um, you know, I th I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get it. It has to be. You know, we have to raise the rate of insurance for for all employees when they're disabled, and we have to ensure that 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 when people have to take time off from work to take care of a loved one, to, you know, to have a new baby, um, that they can do so without suffering enormous financial hardship that makes it virtually The governor impossible. took some action. Well, he, he's, 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 he's a supporter. Supporting. And, and um, we're hopeful that, that he will support it um, uh, aggressively and that, that he will, you know, somehow, you know, convince. It's the mayor who took the executive. The, the mayor did yeah. a great thing. I've right. been saying for years, what we have to do is we have to figure out a way to sort of like just start. adopt it. We yeah. have to start it someplace. And I actually couldn't figure out how. And I was delighted when, yeah. when the mayor adopted paid family leave, it, not for the union employees, because right. he can't do that unilaterally, yeah. but for, the, for other you know, tens of thousands, actually, Same. of city employees. Mm -hmm. And, and you see all these smiling so moms and dads and babies. It's slowly on its way. It's, I think it's on, on yeah, its way. Yeah. Um, now you wanted to talk about yeah. Muslim surveillance. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. So what happened? What was the court decision on that? Well, there is a settlement, a um, settlement. Uh, yeah. in that. And, and the city has basically agreed to end suspicionless surveillance of um, the Muslim community and Muslim organizations, and that's a big deal. Um, the, the other piece of it, for those of us who've been around for a lot of decades, is, is the restoration of a civilian um, a representative mm. in the context of the Hanshu mm. uh, decision. Um, Hanshu was the, the case after um, one of the Panther trials where, where it was um, exposed, the level of pol NYPD political surveillance that was going on. And they set up the Hanshu Authority, which was supposed to monitor and make sure that the government wasn't collecting dossiers on political <laughs> critics of, of, of <laughs> the, the status quo. And, and um, we have gotten an agreement to a, a, um, a civilian um, representative to, to, to participate in, 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 in police department oversight. Who appoints is, that person? The mayor. The okay. mayor, as yeah. you know, and so it's interesting when Hanshu was first um, uh, settled, many people thought. When you know, was that? Dan? 84, 85, mm. something like that. And, and, and the same group of lawyers, you know, is on the case <laughs> now as was then. It started with the New York Civil Liberties yeah. Union. People have gone on to different things. And yeah. um, um, but but but, you know, at the time, people thought, well, this is like very little. As it turns out, it this is a big. lot, you know, the, the ongoing court oversight. And the judge in the case recognizes that, you know, political surveillance and First Amendment are going to be um, in tension, you know, all the time. The, gov the police department's always going to be tempted to engage in surveillance of government critics. And so it's important that we, that we resist that, oversee it, and make sure that it doesn't eclipse with the right recent person. revelation that the police department is able now to monitor cell phones, but that's in all the in all the dramas on television, can't they always locate somebody <laughs> totally, on a cell phone? Totally. So yeah, right. Yeah. So do, is it that they don't get a warrant to do that? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> we've challenged. We've used the freedom of information law to find out what's going on <laughs> with this technology, yeah. not just in New York City, but up oh, in Erie County. Um, in Erie County, they said, you know, we never use it, and we always get a warrant if we do. It turns out that they use it. They never get a warrant. You know, in New York City, they 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 um, sometimes get a um, uh, what's called a pen register, which is a court order um, that is not based on a warrant standard, which is probable right. cause. This has to be relevant to yeah. an ongoing investigation. And and um, you know, we we uncovered in our FOIL case <laughs> that there were over a thousand uses of the the pen registers to to and to scoop up cell phone data and everybody says so they know where I am big deal turn on the GPS tracking whatever yeah. and 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 it's not just the location they can also Listen. grab your texts and so and 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 the problem for New Yorkers is that that 
there has been no public discourse, no oversight of what's going on. And we're talking about military grade technology. Mm. So, so what the freedom of information you know, uh, mm. revelations tell us is that New York, we've got a problem. We've got a privacy problem, and you know, let's have some oversight. You know, not saying that we shouldn't use the technology ever. Not saying that we should. The question is, let's do it right. These procedures mean something. We should have to get a warrant. So let's have some oversight and figure out some ways to rein it in. Do you know in. how many cameras there are in the city? No. <laughs> you know, Ronnie, we used Talk to run around. We used to, we used to walk around New York City, you know, and I, could, I could go around. There's a camera. There's right. a camera. There's a camera. Right? And we were shocked, you know, when, when, when actually when Norman Siegel yeah. first did this back in the 90s, you know, oh, my God, there were over 2,000 right. surveillance cameras. You know, they were all, almost all private, virtually none government. Then 9-11 happened, you know, and now there are like, there are so many cameras, can't we can't move. count. Can't. We tried to repeat it 10 years later, you know, like 2005, 2006, and there were too many. We couldn't cover Manhattan. We took, we went <laughs> below 14th Street and came out with like, you know, a, a ridiculous incredible. number. And, and, and we showed how, you know, a couple of neighborhoods, you know, there were like 20 times more surveillance cameras, you know, than, than there were back when we first And even in buildings. In apartment houses. Oh yeah. In our, I mean, all over. It's all over. Yeah. Incredible. It, it's you know, it's so, and it's 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 kind of reassuring sometimes when you when when you're walking someplace and yeah. and you know it's it's under surveillance. If you're going, you don't have a doorman or whatever. Yeah. But then it's also like a false sense of but security. But it's basically, I was going to say, it's basically a record. It's just a record. It right. doesn't Nobody's stop Nobody's going to come anything. rushing to right. it. Right. And, and so, you know, I've, I always yeah. say it's still true. You know, it, while it may help apprehend people, um, I, you know, a surveillance camera cannot come to your aid when you're in yeah. need, whether it's because of a crime or because of an illness, you know. Yeah. And, and it's important that we not get a false sense of security. People are people, and there is no substitute for you and me using our head, you know, in any given situation. And the dangers are not insignificant, you know. Uh, we mm -hmm. all, you know, we all um, assume, you know, we run around our lives, you know, who cares if people see me. You're out in public, you get seen. Yeah. The question is the selective use of the videos yeah. of what we what do they... that's totally innocuous, totally legal, you know, can be stolen, lifted, exposed, photoshopped, you know, to really hurt people. And there's no way to get your reputation mm. back once it's out, not in this day and age. When you, how many people work in your what, what do we call it? Your organization? Yeah, we have the New York Civil Liberties Union has 65 people mm. around the state. We have eight offices. We're in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany. Uh, uh, we're on Long Island, Westchester. We have people all over the state, and we, we're, we're an increasing, I think, increasingly important presence in Albany. Um, and we have lawyers, we have organizers, we have a youth program that's just wonderful, high school kids from the city who, and, and, and we have one uh, growing up in Buffalo now right. as well. So, so we're, we're kind of, we've grown. Yeah. When I, w I was just picturing in my mind, you foil and you start getting this information and who reads it? And do they get excited? I keep seeing Chris Dunn, one of your more act your activist, uh, committed, passionate people. If he looks at the material and he says, look at this, you know, is that well, what happens? Yeah, you know, it, it, it does happen. Um, you know, uh, Chris and I started, like, recording the stop and frisk data, and Chris used to maintain a, a handwritten spreadsheet, you know. Which... This is tribute to your activity. Thank right, because yeah. the figures are lower, yeah. and people are more careful. Absolutely, and we've we've replicated this in so many different areas. The idea that data, you know, the truth mm -hmm. will set us free, you know, mm -hmm. is like you know, um, the the data is so powerful. You know, in Stop and Frisk, it documented the racial lopsidedness. We're fighting for a data law in in Albany called the Stat Act, which will require demographic information about who gets summonses. You know, low level mm -hmm. summons, millions of summonses going out, you know, every year, you know, we need to know what's going on so that we can understand what what this this, you know, criminalization of our, our city is all about who's impacted. And we all know it's black people 
primarily. It's Latinos as well, and it far less impacts white people. And so, so um, we're, we're, we have that legislation in Albany, but we used it also with regard to education, the criminalization of kids, of school discipline. Oh, I mean, you know, was, yes. it, it's sort of like kids getting arrested for what? Disorderly conduct? Hello? Is that called misbehavior? You go to the principal's office, yeah. you have detention? You know, even that is better than what they getting do. Getting handcuffed and Handcuffed, taken. paraded out of school for writing on the desk. You know, I, I remember Chelsea Frazier's case like it was, you know, I just think of it. I, you know, I remember Biko Edwards, um, you know, kids who, 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 whose lives were upended when the adults supposed, who were supposed to protect them, you know, turned into, you know, real, you know, um, demons. Um, Are the school them. guards official employees of the city or is that a contract? Act? Oh yeah, no, they're, they're, they're official employees of the city. They're, they're the school safety division of the police mm -hmm. department. <clears throat> and well, there are lots and lots of fabulous school safety officers and some fabulous leaders there. And we work closely with them in our efforts with the, the de Blasio administration to, to overhaul, to reform the, the, the school culture of exclusionary discipline. And, you know, the mayor has said that he, he opposes arresting kids in school for minor stuff. Mm -hmm. he, um, I oppose arresting kids in school unless there's an, you know, like there's a, an imminent threat, serious threat to, to, to the health and welfare of the kids and the school community. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to, you know, undo to, some, to use it as a teachable moment. And, and it, it, it gets more difficult, too, as the teacher turnover and you get newer teachers. I mean, I still bristle when I have to go, when I go into a school and I see everybody has to go through a metal detector. It's crazy. And, we and, remember when you didn't. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's so much harder to get a metal detector out of a school, even when there hasn't been an incident in, like, decades. You know, it's harder to get it out because everybody says, well, what if? Well, what if we have for the past hundred years before this, you know, had a fine situation in our schools. And you know what? Yeah, you can't rely on a police state mentality, you know, to keep the kids safe. You have to rely on good schools. Right. Absolutely. And common sense. Yeah. Your what if, I mean, when you think about it, you can trace it to everything. What if somebody on parole is let out? the fear that they don't get out. What is, if I give clemency to somebody, that something happens? Or what if, I mean, it's an endless list, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's really, it's really, <laughs> um, you know, I think fear-based political, you know, politicians are not known, as you said, for their courage. Um, they're known for trying to stay in office. Um, and I don't love term limits, but there's an argument for it. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it's really, important that our political leaders have courage and that we we hold their feet to the fire on the courage issue because you know it's crazy for example let's talk clemency you know how much clemency have we seen out of you know obama or the governor um, for people who have been in jail for decades you know no matter how horrific the crime the Brinks robbery, for example. Mm -hmm. There is no way that a model prisoner like Judy Clark or David Gilbert, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who have been in jail for decades, who are well into their close to 70. 34, right? 35 years. Right. They've paid their debt to society. Yeah. Like, and when let the them statistics show the recidivism rate for people who've been in that long is practically zero. Exactly. Exactly. So, 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 so you know, as a society, you know, we can talk about ending mass incarceration, but, but we need to embrace the notion of, of rehabilitation, of redemption. And, and that's true for prisoners who've been in jail forever, for too long. And it's also true for kids. You know, kids, you know, New York we is started. one of two states that has not raised the age of okay. criminal responsibility. Kids have done some horrific crimes in their day, but everybody knows, uh, or not enough people know, maybe, um, <laughs> that, 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 that kids are, you know, are works in progress. Mm -hmm. And nobody's saying you don't hold kids accountable for wrongdoing. Of course you do. Um, but, but we can't condemn them to a life in jail, a life of, of, of being thrown in the garbage heap 
um, for doing something wrong, doing something bad, really hurting people when they are kids. We have to help them, right. you know, sort of uh, grow Especially up. Especially young men with the 16. We know and, young, and they're slower, aren't they, in developing? Totally. They're but but you know what? And it's not just, it's not just, you know, all young men who no. are who are saddled with our retributive right. approach. It's young men of color, and 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 whether it's you know who gets busted for uh, for having a, a marijuana joint, um, who gets busted for being in the park, on, you know, uh, late at night, who gets busted for for riding a bike on the sidewalk. It's black men, young African American men who bear the brunt of it. And we as a society bear the brunt and we're just waking up to the fact because the collateral damage of losing a generation of people, forget so, about the, the 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 desperate inhumanity, the dire inhumanity of it mm -hmm. of it all, sort of as a society, we are losing mm -hmm. out. And so hopefully, you know, New York will wake up and realize I was delighted to see that um, Melissa Mark Viverito mm -hmm. has called for like, you know, wiping the warrants off the books that are yeah. hanging over people's heads. Yeah. I think her initiatives have been quite wonderful. I think so too. We've come to the end. Oh. So you're going to have to come back because we really didn't discuss can we ever end this racial problem that we have before us and also what your priorities are. What are you going to do? So people can certainly look at your website, nyclu.org. That's it. And keep up with you, see what you're working on, volunteer if they want to, Absolutely. and especially contribute. Right? Absolutely. Contributing is like really good. We don't take <laughs> government money. We depend on, as they say in Channel 13, yeah. people like you. Yeah. Well, thank you so <laughs> much, Donna Thanks, Lieber. Ronnie. It's great to see you. <laughs>